Good morning. I know Peter had already greeted you and made you feel welcome through our praise and worship this morning, uh, but I also wanted to, uh, to greet some friends of mine from Alabama who are listening in via the web, so welcome Alabama. It's not very often that you are feel, you're felt welcome in the state of Georgia. Um, several weeks ago, uh, Rob and I talked about uh, me speaking this morning and and teaching the word and and uh, here lately I've really tried to instead of doing topical sermons, really tried to follow uh, where Rob left off and and uh, when he left off in Romans chapter 15 a couple of weeks back, I started reading through the verses after he left off. I thought, man, yeah, this isn't very. This is kind of Leviticus type stuff, and and uh, so I, I was really in my mind. I was really struggling, um, and how, you know how this was all going to come together. And believe it or not, this is the quickest a sermon has ever came together for me. As I as I began to put it down on paper, the way the Lord worked through me, it was almost like Him saying, "None of my stuff is boring." What were you thinking? And, and so it just the, the words just came alive to me. So this morning, as we go through uh, this passage in Romans chapter 15, I, I, I just I pray that I am a faithful messenger to God's word because it's God that we bring glory to. It's not any of us, but it's God. So if you would uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. We're in Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 21. Romans 15 verse 14 through 21 says now I myself am confident concerning you my brethren that you also are full of goodness filled with all knowledge able also to admonish one another nevertheless brethren I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word this morning, I pray that it will be fully understandable to us, that there will not be any question, no mystery, Father, that we can take these verses and apply them to our lives right now and for the rest of our lives. It's not something that we hear and we soon forget, but Father, that it changes the way we look at you. It changes the way that we look at our communities. It changes the way we interact with our families, Father. That's my prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So beginning in chapter 12 of Romans, Paul writes about several topics to those in Rome that could be construed as criticism. He talks about things like being living sacrifices to God, serving God with spiritual gifts, behave like a Christian, submit to the government, love your neighbor, put on Christ, the law of liberty, the law of love, bearing others' burdens, glorify God together. Now, People can take those as good things, but they can also take them as, what, I'm not doing that already type of attitude. But that's not what Paul was really trying to do. So when he gets to verse 14 of chapter 15, he says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Paul is letting them know even with his previous admonishments, they are full of goodness that they have been filled with all knowledge of the gospel message and are able to build one another up in Christ. Matter of fact, some of the early manuscripts have others instead of one another. 
meaning that they are able to also admonish the Jewish converts as well. It's not just the Gentiles. In verses 15 and 16, he goes on and says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the gospel or because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that he or that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit Paul is reminding them of God calling him out on the road to Damascus as a minister to the Gentiles this word ministering is similar to the Jewish custom prior to Christ, where you had the priests uh, ministering to the people, to the Jewish nation. Um, it was the actual act of the priest. So Paul is saying that he is presenting them to God as an acceptable offering. He makes it very clear, though, that he is only presenting the gospel. God is providing the Holy Spirit upon their acceptance of Christ. It's not him. It's not about us. It's all about God. As we move through this world, there are many things and lives that we touch. We must always be careful to attribute those things of God to him, not ourselves. It can be easy to take the credit for certain things. When we stay in constant contact with God and stay close to him through his word, it makes it easy. When everything we say, listen to this, when everything we say is to build up and edify the church, fellow believers, and Christ himself, it makes it easy. We as Gentiles, accepting Christ as our Savior, have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified, set apart. We've been set apart for Christ. The Bible says in John 17, 17, John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. God's word is truth. His word, the Bible, tells us that if we believe that Jesus Christ died for all our sins and we accept him as our Savior, that we will have eternal life with him in heaven. As believers... We have been set apart first by the truth of God's word and doubly by the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit as that seal of redemption within us. The Bible tells us that. And this is the picture that I get in my mind when I think of this seal. It's like those little flashy shoes that little kids have. Every time you take a step, it lights up. And when I think of this as being the, the, the seal of the Holy Spirit within us, and it's like every time we take a step, God says, there you are, there you are, there you are. That's what I think of in my mind. Now, this is not Paul's rendition. This did not come from the book of Romans. This is my own word picture, okay? I want to make sure you don't get that confused there. That's all mine. So in verse 17, it talks about, uh, or it says, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. Now, the way I was taught, as you read through the Bible and you see the word therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. Does that make sense? So you've got to go back up and look at what came before it. So when we look back at 15 and 16, Paul reminds the Romans that he is the minister appointed by God for the Gentiles. He is able to offer them up as a sacrifice. But he is saying in verse 17 that he is not reveling in his own works, nor wants glory for his actions. He only wants to glory or boast, as some translations say, in Christ Jesus. In what Christ was to him. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's what Christ was to Paul. Paul could boast of what he had from him and through him. Spiritual blessings in him. A large measure of grace he had received from him, and of great gifts and talents Christ had bestowed on him. He gloried in his cross and boasted of a crucified Jesus whom others despised. He made Christ the subject of his ministry and took delight in preaching the gospel. 
he freely owned that all he did was through Christ strengthening him and that all of his success in his work was owed to him being Jesus. And of this, he had to glory. And that's some good preaching. That's some good preaching right there. Let's pause here for a moment. How often do we glory in the Lord or boast about Jesus Christ who saved us? How can we ascribe our life and everything in it to the Holy One? Our family, our jobs, our communities, our friendships all come from God. We can do nothing on our own. John chapter 15 verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. As a challenge to all of us, let's practice this week boasting about Christ. He's done everything. His words while hanging on the cross were, it is finished. No matter how many people with whom we share the gospel or how, how many people uh, we feed when hungry, no matter how many people we visit in prison or how many folks we close, it will never equal what Christ did on the cross for all humanity. I'm not saying don't take the gospel to others. I'm not saying don't feed, visit, or clothe. I am saying that when we do, it is not for our glory that we do these things, but for Christ alone. The only reason we would ever do these things in the beginning is because of what he has already done. Verse 18 and 19, back in Romans chapter 15. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying in verse 18 that he will not take credit for work others have done through Christ. He will also have nothing to do with false doctrines which may have been taught. He only wants to focus on those things that Christ has done through him. In verse 19, he confirms that he comes with the power of the Holy Spirit as seen through mighty signs and wonders. These were the marks of the apostles and the early church leaders as there were no other marks to show they, they were foundation layers, Christ being the only foundation. There was no written New Testament yet. It was just the apostles preaching the gospel and the message being carried by those that received it. Paul was called by Christ himself to fulfill this role. In Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 22, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Jesus Christ is the foundation for all mankind, whether we accept him or not. It does not matter if we accept Christ as our Savior or not. He is still the chief cornerstone. Just because some don't believe it to be doesn't make it so. The apostles and prophets are not the foundation, simply the foundation layers. In Acts chapter 14, verse 3, Acts 14, verse 3, it says, Therefore they, being the disciples, stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, these were the mark, marks of the apostles. These were not new signs. These mighty works were a continuation of the work of Christ from the time he turned the water into wine 
mentioned in the first uh, in the second chapter of John to the catching of 153 fish in a net that did not break written about in John chapter 21 these miracles were established by Christ and after his ascension his apostles could be known by them at some point later after the gospel message had spread through the land it was not just dependent on the signs and wonders brought by the messengers of the word the word also had to be preached matter of fact in 2 John verse 10 and 11 2 John 1st 2nd 3rd John 2 John verse 10 it says if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine do not receive him into your house nor greet him for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds this is not to say signs and wonders don't exist or that miracles no longer happen it does not mean the spiritual gifts cease on the contrary these signs and wonders and spiritual gifts can happen when Jesus' doctrine is brought to non-believers and they accept him as their savior. It happens when believers assemble according to his doctrine to pray and lift up holy hands. It happens when one of our brethren is restored to righteousness according to the doctrine after falling away or being encumbered with sin. All of these are examples of miracles we see each and every day. Without the doctrine, the holy word of God, how would we even know that these are even miracles? There are some that practice some of these miracles, wonders, and signs and don't have the doctrine. We must be careful, friends, to steer clear of those folks. Else, as the Bible says in 2 John, we share in their evil deeds. Our job in life as Christians is not to figure out what all of these other religions are. It's not to figure out what Allah means. It's not to figure out what this means or what that means or why they do this instead. No, our job as Christians is to take the gospel message to others. Period. The only way we can know what to avoid is to thoroughly know God's word. If we don't know God's word, how can we walk away from what's being taught that's evil? There are hundreds of reading plans to help us read the Bible. There are 90-day plans. There are weekday plans. There are one-year plans. Plans that remind us that it doesn't take long to read a chapter, 345. But it's not about how long it takes us to read a chapter or even the entire Bible. The task is not to simply read, but to understand, to apply, and to share. That's our role. It's not, yep, I, I read today, I read today, I read today, I'm, I'm in good shape. No, that's not, it's not a checklist. The Bible isn't something that we can just right off as we get things read in it you can't just read it once I gotta read it over and over and over again so that I fully understand what is God saying that I need to change in my life what is he saying that I need to take out and present as a gospel message that's why I read the word the Bible contains over 600 characteristics or names of God the other day, and I've got this, this guy that I work with, his name's David. We have a cup of, cor a cup of coffee every morning about 5.30. Uh, and it's just, it's a great time. And uh, he and I started just on accident almost meeting together. And, and it quickly rolled into a spiritual meeting. And it's just, it's really been a blessing to me. But I, as we were sitting there talking over coffee one morning, I said to him, I said, you know, if I were to go up on the top of our building that we work at right now, and I was going to shout praises to the Lord, going back to these 600 names of God that you see up on the screen, if I were trying to recall all of these different names, how long would I be able to shout praises? Would I be able to do it for 15 minutes? The song that you guys ended with, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. Shout it from the mountains. Wow. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of when, when 
When I'm thinking about the praise to God, how long could I, how well do I know the Bible to be able to shout for a long period of time? Because I want to. I really do. But after a period of time, it's like I run out of, uh, what do I need to say now? I, I can't remember anything else to add to it. But would it be for 15 minutes? Five minutes? Two minutes? Rob was talking earlier about uh, spending some time in prayer for this, for this prison ministry. A half an hour is a long time to pray. A long time to pray. And it's, it's okay if you're in a, in, in three or four of you are gathered together. It makes it a little bit easier to make it through that. Not that we have to time prayer or anything, but to sit down and continuous focus on that prayer time without my mind wandering, it's very, very difficult for me to do. I'll get a hunger pain, and I'm, now I'm thinking about what's for lunch, and I, I just get, I'm all over the place. It's a gift to be able to spend that much time in prayer before the Lord. But how well, how well do we know the Bible? How well have we uh, studied those characteristics of Christ, those characteristics of God, so that when it is our opportunity to praise him in front of others, that we can do it. I constantly think of that video title, That's My King. And I mentioned it, and Dana said, you're not going to show that again, are you? I love that thing. Every time I watch it, it, man, it brings tears to my eyes thinking about it. But as this guy, Pastor S.M. Lockridge, he is for two or three minutes straight, not even taking a breath hardly, he is just rambling up about Christ and about God. And after he does this for two or three minutes, portraying God, he says, I wish I could describe him to you. It just gives me goosebumps thinking about that. Would, and he's not reading from any notes. He's just standing up here like I am right now, and he is just, this is who God is to me. He is my redeemer. He died for me on the cross. The Pharisees couldn't stop him. And he just, he's just going on. And Wow. That's my God. That is my God. How well do we know our King and Master? Can we recount the numerous miracles we have witnessed both through His Word and in our lives? If we can't describe Him to someone in a way that causes them to be obedient to the calling through the Holy Spirit, shame on us. If we don't have that intimate knowledge of our Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the bright and morning star, I'm going to get choked up here in a minute just thinking about what great God we serve. How can we possibly know what is false and not of the true doctrine contained in the Bible? As believers, it is imperative that we see the world through Christ's eyes. And when we are presented with something that is not of God, we resist. The Bible tells us in James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We cannot resist if we don't know the absolute goodness and truth of the living word of God. Verse 20 and 21, Romans 15. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to him he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Here Paul is describing his true calling, being a missionary. Paul was not saying he was too, too proud to build on another man's foundation. He was simply saying it was his honor and calling to go where no man had gone before, to present the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There were no church leaders to meet him. There were no committees preceding him, preparing the place where he would speak. There was no ribbon cutting or being greeted by the mayor. Matter of fact, the only public figure who may have greeted him was the chief of police, and that was only to arrest him. It is one thing to go from one church to another or one community to another and talk to other believers. 
it is quite different to go somewhere to talk about Jesus with someone who has never heard the name. I do not want to take away from the power of local ministries. That is not what I am trying to do. I am simply saying that there are some folks, like Paul, that are called into the ministry in order to take the message to those that have never heard it. There are others that are equipped to deal with the de-churched. Folks that have been disenchanted, for instance, with a particular church and turned away from organized religion. There are those, too, who are equipped to lovingly bring back those that have fallen away due to the struggles of life. God has equipped each of us with an ability to draw people to him. Think about it. As believers, with our light-up shoes, being the Holy Spirit, how can we not have a desire to bring others to the feet of Jesus? What anointing have you received enabling you to lock arms with someone and accompany them to the king of glory. Are you using it? If so, how are you encouraging others to do the same? If not, why not? What other encouragement besides having this joyous life in Christ could you possibly need? Really? If we love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to serve him with all of our heart, mind, and strength, why would we not want to bring other people to him? As Christians, we should not view sharing the gospel like some folks view an exercise program when they realize they need to get healthy. <laughs> this should not be viewed as a program, but a way of life. Each and every one of our breaths should be praising the Almighty Son of God. Every action, every facial expression, every eye movement we have should be intentional and bring praise to our Father in Heaven. Have you ever brought someone to the throne of Christ where they accepted Him as their Savior? Wow, that is an awesome experience. I'm telling you, if you've never done it, Man, it just, it just brings chill bumps to you because you realize that they have seen the face of Jesus. There is no greater feeling or thrill. And when you present the gospel message to someone and when you look, when you see the look of shame and guilt in their eyes and then you see it quickly flash to relief and joy. Even the angels in heaven want to study this event. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 12, it says, To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, that through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. The angels in heaven, they'll never experience that. They will never be able to experience the feeling of accepting Christ. They've always been with him since their creation. We, on the other hand, get to experience the redemptive power of the Savior. We get to finally accept this free gift and our spiritual burdens begin to melt away as we repent of those sins that we have in our life and continue to repent through the remainder of our life as we obey that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Paul finishes up the last verse 21 with, It is written, To whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. This could probably be considered Paul's life verse. Paul was set on delivering the message to those who had never heard nor seen through this, Christ was made alive to those that heard and accepted their new Savior. I've heard many folks say they have a life verse. This may be a verse you feel that describes you. It may be one that describes what you feel Christ has called you to do. It may be one that helped you during a crisis in your life. Whatever the reason, it's a verse that you can go back to periodically to refresh, refresh yourself as needed. I'm not suggesting that you have one. I'm not suggesting that you don't. What I want to point out is that Paul is quoting the scriptures. He probably had it memorized rather than thumbing through the rolls of parchment. 
I think that memorization of Scripture is a dying art. With the advent of e-Bibles and the Internet, it's so easy to look something up. Again, I'm not saying using these tools that are available to us are a bad thing. Some have value, but I think that there is value in memorizing Scripture. Imagine, all right, I'm going to draw a little picture here for you. Imagine if every time that you were asked about your family, you had to pull out your phone and say, hang on just a minute, let me, uh, let me look that up. That's why it's important to memorize Scripture. I'm not talking about Facebook when you're trying to get a hold of people. I'm talking about what color hair do they have? Let me see. We have to know the Word. We have to know the Word of God. I want to uh, read several verses, and I want to see if you can tell me what they have in common. The first verse is, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16.31. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is great. Ephesians 6, 1. Depart from evil and do good. Psalm 34, 14. Even a child is known by his doings. Proverbs 20, 11. Fear not, for I am with thee. Isaiah 43, 5. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Honor thy father and thy mother. Exodus 20, verse 12. I am the vine, you are the branches. John 15, 5. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. Keep thy tongue from evil. Psalm 34, 13. Look unto me and be ye saved. Isaiah 45, 22. Marvel not, you must be born again. John 3, 7. No man can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 118, 1. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 127, 1. Quench not the spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Exodus 20, verse 8. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Proverbs 3, 5. Unto us a child is born, Isaiah 9, 6. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, Romans 12, 19. Wait on the Lord, Psalm 27, 14. Exceeding great and precious promises are given unto us. 2 Peter 1.4 You are the light of the world. Matthew 5.14 Zion heard and was glad. Psalm 97.8 Did you figure out what ties these verses together? The alphabet. Several years ago, my pastor in Ohio, uh, Pastor Dale Geyser, was preaching. And his mom and dad, both in their 80s, were in the service. And out of nowhere, he said, Hey, Mom, do you remember your alphabet? And she said, I sure do. And Goldie proceeded to say, A, and then read that verse. B, and read the verse. She went all the way through the entire alphabet. And only twice during that time, her husband, Elmer, who was in his 80s as well, had to remind her and help her only twice that's how she was taught her alphabet in school. Memorizing the scriptures. When was the last time we memorized the scripture and more importantly and then was able later to share it with someone? We have to bury his word in our hearts and our minds. As Christians, we have a responsibility to honor the word of God in our lives if we only kind of know it, we will only kind of honor him. 
Imagine if you were on a Major League Baseball team. You would not show up to the game without your hat or cleats. When we show up for life, we need to be fully clothed in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. How brightly are your shoes lighting up? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing this Word alive, if nothing else for me this morning, Father. What a blessing it is to dig into your Word, to study it, Lord, and more importantly, to apply it. Lord, I am so thankful for this body of believers here, Lord. The number of volunteers we have that make everything happen, make everything fall into place. And it's all to bring glory to you, Father. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.